There I am. A little bit of a delay this time. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing all right. End of the week. Um, it'll be a fun weekend. There's random pieces of photographic equipment go launching off my uh, my counter here. Um, I want to make a quick video. Uh, someone sent me a link. Some articles regarding the search warrant being executed on Alec Baldwin's uh, cell phone. So I had a chance to review the search warrant. And uh, boy, what a mess. But before we get into that, um, there were some questions about why they why um, a search warrant was required and what that means. And, and some people were saying that, uh, you know, why not just turn it over? They're going to get it anyway. Um, why not consent and what the pros and cons are? So um, the you should always, always um, request that almost always request that a search warrant is provided if you're going to turn anything over to, to law enforcement. Um, from a law enforcement officer's perspective, we always tried to get both. You always want to get consent and a search warrant. The reason being that if um, you get the search warrant and the search warrant's defective and it's challenged in court and it's going to be that evidence is evidence going to be suppressed, you can fall back onto the consent and say, well, forget the search warrant, they consent in any way. So uh, the, very much the double bagging it approach from, from my perspective, at least when we were doing it, was to always get both. But of course, uh, most of the time, you weren't going to get consent. And so you had to rely on your search warrant. So Alec Baldwin was asked for uh, to produce his phone by law enforcement. And he flat out said uh, through his attorneys, we're requiring a search warrant. And why that's important and why that's the smart move is because um, they can challenge that uh, that search warrant, the pre in pretrial motions, if he's ultimately charged. So if he's charged and they're going to use this evidence against them, they can go through the search warrant application. And if they can figure out a way to make an argument that it's defective in some way that can get suppressed. If they had consented, that was going to get in, going to get in anyway. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's taking an oppositional posture, um, with law enforcement. And law enforcement should understand that they shouldn't take that like personally or anything. That's what a good lawyer should be telling them to do. But at the same time, it lets you know that he's positioning himself potentially that if he gets charged, um, that they have at least this uh, opportunity. So going to the search warrant affidavit itself, I do find some things in here that are a little bit, um, a little bit uh, weak. I mean, the basis for any search warrant is you have to establish probable cause that the thing you're looking to search has some connection and bearing to the crime you're investigating. And it's pretty weak overall. Um, there's some think language in here that says, you know, generally criminals, you know, someone involved in a crime will use a phone, you know, before, during, and after, which is like so nonspecific. Uh, I'm not sure how that argument's effective. It would be effective for any court to say that, uh, well, generally people use your phone. So, you know, we want to look at your shit. Um, you have to be a little bit more specific uh, uh, with regard to search warrant applications. They do go on later on to tie the phone back to potential, um, you know, criminal activity, uh, it, later on in the affidavit. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So it's probably, you know, uh, the search warrant itself is probably fine, but it's definitely, definitely on the weaker side. But having said that there's some great, um, there's some great information in here that I don't think is being discussed, uh, much, um, outside of just the news reporting on the search warrant, but the, the devil's in the details and the aff aff the affiant, the person swearing out the search warrant has to provide the supporting information of why they want to look at it. And there's some good stuff in here. So, um, you know, I'll share my screen here for a second. Let's see, I'll go to this tab. So here's the search warrant. Um, about eight pages long, uh, standard language in the beginning of it. It just lays out what they're going to be looking for. Uh, in this case, it's uh, anything related to or data that's on the phone. So they lay out, um, you know, GPS information, text information, email information. And we were talking about this last night on last night's video, which was that the idea that your messages and everything's encrypted. Yes, it is in transit as it's being transmitted. It's not being stored anywhere. But once they get your phone, all of that information is now uh, accessible. Um, Alec didn't have to provide uh, the pin code um, to the phone. I, 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 he could have just said, hey, I lost it. I forgot it. Uh, I'm not giving it to you. Um, I'm not saying that's the smart move in this situ situation. It's probably not, but that would have made it a lot more difficult to get access to the content. But nonetheless, the search warrant initially uh, just lays out everything that is uh, that they're looking for in here. 
uh, all graphic files, multimedia files. This language is, is hysterical because it hasn't changed much in many years just because it's the same language copy and pasted from other law enforcement applications regarding the types of data that sits on a cell phone. It's basically everything. It's everything on your phone. Um, so then it goes into the uh, uh, facts tending to establish that the foregoing grounds for issuance of a search warrant are as follows. And, and the affiant, who's a police officer, the person swearing this out, lays out their, their investigation and, their, and some of their conversations that this uh, investigator had with um, Hannah, who is the armorer. Uh, if you remember Hannah, let's see, this is Hannah. Here we go. There's uh, there's Hannah, double guns, double guns. She was the armorer on set, uh, young. She was like in her 20s, I think. Um, there's definitely some weird photos in here. This one drives me insane. This, this one here, uh, and again, I'm not going to, maybe she corrected her after this, but this is the, the, some of the most horrible uh, shooting posture you can have here, positioning. Your, your weight is totally off-centered. If that gun has any kind of uh, recoil, that girl's going to go launching backwards. And so I'm not sure why she's not correcting her here in this, in this picture, but it, it drives me crazy. And I know it drives a lot, a lot of other people crazy looking at something like this. But here she is, double double guns in it, in it up here uh, on set, I guess. Um, and so there was interviews with her about what happened on the morning of the uh, shooting. And it's a shit show. It's a total shit show in terms of uh, the the protocols they had for keeping track of these guns where they went. It's um, it's laughable when you read it because it seems like the guns got on set early that morning around 7 a.m. And then were basically passed around. Um, and ended up in multiple parties' hands, uh, even to the point where it ended up with, um, this part is interesting, um, Hannah advised when they all returned from lunch, Sarah pulled the gun out. Sarah's one of her co-workers that was helping her manage the guns, but it just seemed to add to the confusion having these two people because Hannah and Sarah completely didn't seem like they were on the same page about the status of the guns throughout the process. One of the dummy rounds were loaded, um, who had them, who had access to them, when they were last checked. Um, so Hannah advised that when all the all returned from lunch, Sarah pulled the gun out of the safe, the gun utilized by Alec, and handed it to her. Affian asked Hannah if she loaded the gun after lunch, to which she stated it was already loaded before they went to lunch, which I think is something that's contradicted earlier in another interview that they had, that, 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 that guns um, were loaded but partially loaded. Hannah advised we had the gun the whole time before that, and nothing happened and it wasn't in there and there wasn't even supposed to be pulling the hammer back. What an interesting statement. So you're saying that the, the, the dummy round, when she's saying it wasn't in there, meaning that the live round wasn't in there, um, but then throws in gratuitously and they weren't even supposed to be pulling the hammer back. Well, there was, if there was some rule about that on set, that if you were handling those guns, um, that you weren't supposed to be pulling the hammer back unless maybe the armorer had like approved that activity or, 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 uh, whatever. She's already throwing that out there saying he wasn't supposed to be doing that. So there's already a conflict between what he's thinking he's allowed to do and what she's saying he's allowed to do. And as we talked about him being a producer and technically she being, um, someone who's employed by him on set, it brings up an interesting conflict of, well, then who was supposed to be the one responsible for making sure these weapons were safe and that people weren't manipulating them in a way, pulling the hammer back uh, when they weren't supposed to. So as Affian asked Hannah to clarify, the Affian's the police officer. So the police officer asked Hannah to clarify where the guns were located before lunch, to which she responded, they were inside with the camera crew and she was hardly allowed inside due to COVID precautions. What the fuck? So you have a guns in a room with the camera crew people who could be lunatics for all you know, and you're not allowed to go in and inspect the guns, um, safeguard the guns because of COVID restrictions, which is just insane that you're, you're putting the, the risk of COVID infection over the uh, proper handling and safety of uh, managing weapons in a safe way and making sure that they they stay safe. So, uh, and she was hardly allowed inside due to COVID precautions hannah advised she handed the gun to alec a couple of times in the morning inside the set hannah said at one point dave halls another individual had the gun when he was sitting in for the shot 
She advised she handed the gun off to Dave while he was sitting in. And this handoff occurred after lunch. So this gun's being passed around. Um, I can't imagine that protocol is in that every time this gun is handled by another individual and the armorer's eyes are taking off of it for just even a split second, that that gun needs to be inspected again. Because any person on the set could just load in a live round, hand it back to Alec, and now you know they just get Alec to commit a murder uh, unknowingly. Uh, Aff Affian asked, so the police officer asked Hannah, when the last time she looked loaded the gun was and she advised she loaded the gun with five dummy rounds before lunch. This is insane. This part Hannah stated there was one round that wouldn't go in. So after lunch, she took the clean, took the cleaner, cleaned it and put another round in, which brought the total to six rounds loaded in the weapon. Hannah described the gun to be a long barrel, 45 caliber. So there was a problem with the, inserting the last round um she cleaned it i guess the actual chamber for it and then put another round in so you wonder if during that process of putting the dummy the dummy round wouldn't go in so you put the dummy round maybe in your pocket you go over to a desk to clean the weapon maybe you reach in your pocket you pull out a live round and now that you just put the live round back in the gun you're not thinking because you're focused on cleaning the gun um that seems to me to me to be a likely place where that could have happened. Hannah advised they all went to lunch at 1230. And after they came back, she said, Sarah took the guns to the set. Sarah's one of her like co-workers assistants. She said the gun, the guns were all in bags at this point and described the bags to look like socks. She stated the guns were checked on set. Okay. Well, so you check them on set. So they don't have any live rounds in them. Right. However, she didn't really check it too much. The firearm due to it being locked up at lunch. Hannah said after she did the check, she put in the last round. So none of this makes any sense. She's saying, oh, yeah, I checked it. I checked it all over the place. And then she's hedging and saying, but I really didn't check it that much because it was locked up. Well, locked up, but who could have had access to it during that time period? So you, you, you can't just assume because you locked it up, especially when you're when other people have access to that, that that couldn't have been the point that somebody threw a live round in there. Um, and then she talks about... Uh, she talks about uh, the, the, the so the shooting happens. Hannah hears the shot. She says she goes running in. Hannah said when she checked the gun after the incident, she checked the cartridge, which would, would have been the one fired and said that the first one she pulled out didn't have that pointing to the projectile end of the bullet. Hannah said she checked all the other rounds and that they all had a ringing sound when she shook them or a hole in the side indicating it was a dummy round. Hannah advised the box of dummies may have had some wonky rounds and they received the proper the box approximately a week ago from her from her supplier doesn't matter at this point she still thinks that that the there was a wonky blank in there that caused the shooting not realizing it was actually a, a, a live round um she didn't think anyone on the set would maliciously put a live round in there um and then it goes on to the discussion with alec so um alec was interviewed after this um he was advised of his miranda rights and agreed to speak with detectives so Again, I don't know about that. Um, I guess if he's convinced of his innocence, he thought that might be a smart move. But um, I'm surprised his lawyers let him do that and speak speak to the detectives without uh, them being present. Nonetheless, he did. Alec advised that he that uh, advised in the scene he slowly takes the gun out of the holster, then very dramatically turns it and cocks the hammer, which, which is when the gun goes off. He said it was supposed to be a cold gun, so no flash charge or anything should have gone off. Alec said all the rounds in the gun were supposed to be cosmetic or dummy. Alec advised when the gun went off, he could recall Helena Hutchins going down to the ground and Joel Souza start screaming. He assumed it was an empty gun. And so um, he still he, he doesn't say anything in here about pulling the trigger. So he's been consistent with that. I mean, in the interview he did, he also said that he did not pull the trigger and that it was when he pulled the hammer back. Um, whether that was technically possible with that gun will be easy to determine. They have the gun so they can test fire that gun. They can, you know, rack that hammer back a hundred times and see how hard or easy it is to, to fire around or whether it's possible at all to fire around without pulling the trigger. I still think he, based on how these accidental discharges happen, the person never remembers pulling the trigger. They they never do. And that's the reason why uh, trigger discipline is so important and why when you hold a weapon, you, of course, 
never keep your finger on the trigger because inadvertently your hand could twitch or when you grip something to pull it out, it's natural for all your fingers to, to retract and you could accidentally pull the trigger. So he, in my opinion, it's very possible that he inadvertently pulled the trigger and didn't realize it. And that the testing of the gun is going to show that the, that it maybe it was possible that the hammer could have fired it, but I bet you they're going to be able to show that it was very unlikely due to the, to the force at which he would have to like fling that, that hammer back or, or, um, manipulate it in a way that it didn't lock, but it, you know, kind of flicked mm -hmm. back and forward with enough force to, to hit the primer and, and fire, fire the round. And then the rest of the affidavit goes into how they dirty up his phone, but dirty up his phone. I mean, in order to get the phone from the search warrant, you have to dirty it. It has to be dirty in some way and how they connect it is kind of goofy because they, that the affiant, the police officer talks about how they, through some of the interviews, they learned that there were emails sent before the shooting and text messages sent before the shooting regarding the gun and the use of it and blah, blah, blah. And therefore, um, it's important for her and her opinion, the police officer's opinion that she wants to know the story leading up to the shooting and that it's important to go back historically to determine, I guess, how the guns ended up on set and how they were purchased and all of that. Um, and so therefore that's the basis of the search warrant because the emails reside on the phone, which again is super weak in my opinion, but probably enough to get you through, but, but super weak in terms of probable, probable cause, but there it is. So some, some interesting things when I read this, just in terms of the complete disorganization around the handling of these weapons, uh, on set, the multiple hands it passed through, it paints a, a really great picture of, of negligence, uh, minimally and whether it it's something that uh, um, rises to um, criminal, I think is, is there's a lot of smoke here that if I'm this investigator looking at this, there's a lot here for me to look at to say that this wasn't just a simple accident that nobody could have prevented. Um, there's a lot of things in here in terms of the handling of this these guns that was just horrendous. And so wouldn't it be hard for the state to go out and find an expert, an actual expert armorer who's been doing this for more than a few years to come in, read through these statements, um, and put an opinion together that says, yeah, this was completely unacceptable in terms of how this, these weapons were handled on set and completely contrary to what, um, the, the, the standards are for, for, uh, you know, safely managing weapons on a set to make sure these types of things don't happen. So I don't think any of this is, is good at all for, um, for anyone involved, including Alec as a producer, uh, you know, if he was just an actor in this, He'd have a better leg to stand on because he he's not really someone who's in a position to to uh, know all of this and be in the know of how all these guns are being handled. He's kind of relying on the expertise of the producers. And uh, the problem is he's one of the producers, so that's where I continue to believe he's going to run into trouble when it when it comes to this. But that's my take on it. Want to make a quick video, um, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy it. Post any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Take care. Enjoy your day, everybody.